Well, no, this is a bit of a reunion for me because we, my wife and I, uh, our family came from here. Four years ago, we moved up to Portland. And so um, it's nice to come back, see friends, see previous students, um, other people that I can't mention, like from what Brandon mentioned. And um, no, just getting to meet you guys. You guys are a great crowd. This is a powerful service, the 11 o'clock, Brandon. Yeah. I mean, the 9 o'clock was great, but this is like, whoo, I started you know, started feeling it, you know, so that's right, <laughs> Logan, that's right, yeah, yeah, lots of good things going on here, it's great to be here with you guys, put your seatbelts on, Brandon has asked for, Pastor Brandon's asked for a Christian psychologist who lives in Portland to come talk to you, if you're familiar with Portland, you know why I'm bringing this up, you guys know Portland's weird, right, <laughs> it's very strange, so, um, yeah, no, it's, it's good to be here with you guys. It's fun. I was watching during worship, the, the little kids up here worshiping. It was so awesome. I was helping Rachel going, oh, Brandon, check these out. And they're like, oh, yeah, this happens every week. I'm like, wow, this is great. It reminded me, the way I felt towards them for doing that, I was like, oh, that is so awesome. It reminded me of the way God feels about us. And the, the whole point behind why I even got into all of this ministry stuff is to basically, I feel called by God to share with people in the body that he is absolutely and ecstatically in love with you. And he desires relationship with you. And that this whole thing is about increasing an in intimacy with him and, as we'll talk about today, being conformed to his image. That's what this is all about. This is all about. And as it was said in the worship, it's not just here. It's actually an eternal issue. The rest of eternity, that's the relationship we're going to abide in. So today, what we're going to take on uh, is a little bit of uh, the depravity that visits us all. You guys know what depravity is, right? Okay. If you don't know what depravity is, Ask your spouse sitting next to you what depravity is. They'll inform that. Uh, uh, we all struggle with stuff, and we all deal with issues, and that's kind of what today is about. I, the, the idea that God is, is absolutely and ecstatically uh, desirous of relationship with you suggests that um, he loves you so much that he would not want to leave you in the same way you're in right now. Right? I, whoa, I, I heard Siri in the background. Was that her? Is she agreeing with me? Okay, good. You have the Logos version of Siri, I think, for those of you who are familiar with theological software. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the things that shows up, as a psychologist, one of the things that shows up in my office all the time is people who are dealing with emotions. And it's, it's something that's so kind of obvious, we don't really talk about it all that much. But that's where the bulk of our suffering comes from. People call me for counseling for three reasons. They're either trying to cope with something, and they're experiencing a lot of distress over what they're trying to cope with. Or they're trying to heal from something, and they're experiencing distress in the healing. Or they're trying to grow in some area, right? They're trying to develop some new skill set or take on some new ability. And the thing of it is, guys... It's a workout. It's a workout. Yes, that's right. <laughs> little, little kid got excited twice. There was kind of, so, yeah. To, to kind of make the point, if I were to ask you a question, if I were to say to you, emotions are blank in today's world, what word would you use to fill in that blank? Important? Tiring. Tiring? <laughs> there it is. What else? Out of control? What's that? Necessary. Necessary. What? Re revealing? Okay. What was it? Oh, lots of good ones here. Un unstable? <laughs> yes. Leading? Suppressed. Suppressed. There we go. That's a good one. Ignored. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you guys kind of know where I'm going here. This is a big deal. Um, George Barna back in 2002, if that feels like, to me, it feels like four years ago when the Barna research came out. It's 2002. That was 16 years ago. <laughs> I'm, I'm aging at this accelerated rate. You guys are getting older. I'm 50 this year, and it feels like time's warping on me, and I, I'm getting older faster. Does that make sense? 
Okay, we're going to have a support group after the service <laughs> for people who are experiencing that. Um, and I'm not leading it. I'm participating. I need someone else to lead it. Uh, this is a distress. Barnett, back in 2002, he conducted some studies, and you've heard many of these uh, reports before. But the majority of people in our country say that their faith is an important part of their life. And they'll just, they even describe themselves in the study when you read it as being deeply spiritual people. What's interesting, though, is the same study showed that less than half of those that describe themselves that way also describe themselves as completely committed to their faith. It's an interesting thing. I'm deeply, deeply spiritual, but I'm not very committed to my faith. Barnes suggested that many Americans may have fallen in love with faith rather than in love with the object of their faith. And this is an important thing from a, from a counselor's perspective. This is important because I know by working with people and, and even in how this operates in my own life, transformation doesn't take place in my interest in faith. Theological understanding takes place in my interest in faith. But transformation takes place in my interest in the object of my faith. Because it's the relationship piece that begins to change everything. Does this make sense? Yes. So I've got to get you guys convinced of something before we start talking about the bad news. Okay? Or not, it's not bad news. It's just it's a workout. It's hard. I've got to get you convinced of something. You've got to get really solid and secure with God before you can start taking on the crap. Because if you're not, you're going to start faking it. And you're going to put a mask on and pretending that everything's fine and you're not. And then you have to, you'll sneak into my office and then you'll disclose it all. And that, save yourself the money and the time. And just do it now, okay? Um, are you solid? When Jesus said it's finished, is it finished in your life? Is it finished? And, and, and that includes those of you who are still working through things. You're still struggling with stuff. You're still not perfect yet. Got some news for you. You're never going to be perfect. Not here. That's not the point. The point is, do you know him? That's the point. And are you inviting him into those workouts and the struggles? It's hard to do, guys. It's really hard to do. I mean, I'm the first person who would admit to you that I struggle with that. This is common to all of us. Um, take the mask off this morning, and let's, let's get real, okay? Okay. It's a lot less demanding to be devoted to the idea of faith than to invest ourselves in a true relationship with the triune living God. The thing I struggle with with my faith and my relationship with God is it's not happy all the time. It's hard sometimes. Um, the workout is hard. Um, it's a little bit like going to the gym. How many of you guys pay to go to the gym? Okay, now logically, thank you for saying disclosing that. Logically, I'm thinking... Why would we pay to go get tortured? <laughs> How many of you guys are working out with a fitness coach? That before? It's a little bit like physical therapy, isn't it? It's a little bit like going to the dentist, right? This is reality, guys. This is reality. Why do you do that? Why do you go to the gym? Feel better? Healthier? What's that? Quality of life? Quality of life? Right? Why else? Come on, give me, give me the, the endorphins. You get big muscles. You look really good. Okay, there's the other stuff too, right? There's, there's all these reasons that we go do that and that we tolerate the pain of that workout, right? We can do that. Well, some of you are still struggling with doing that. But you can. You really can do it. We can do it as long as you remember the reason behind why you're doing it. Does that make sense? Because when you get in the moment and it's painful and it's, it's, it's oh, why am I doing this? And this guy, I'm paying this guy to yell at me. And it says, we forget. When you get into the forest, you start forgetting about the forest. You start thinking about the trees, right? Um, let me suggest to you that, um, how would I put this? This is not on my notes. I'm, my, my charismatic is coming out. I'm derailing from the notes. Um, <laughs> I have an inner charismatic. Uh, um, um, I'm thinking of all these funny things I'm going to say, but I haven't, don't have much time, so I can't get into comedy. What time am I supposed to be done, Brandon? 
12.30? Okay, 11.53. It probably go to 1.30. Is that... <laughs> All right, I'll... 12.30. Do it, do it. Someone said do it, do it. Um, yeah. Um, he, here's the thing. Um, it's the hard stuff in life that we need to invite God into, as opposed to be constantly looking for the easy stuff or the happy stuff. Now, happy stuff is good, but you got to understand, I mean, think about it. When have you grown the most? I'm sorry, but it's just, it is. When have you grown the most is when it's hard. It's, it's the way it's been in my life. When I struggle the most with something is usually where God has a tendency to show up the most, if I let him into it. I think one of the things that shuts us down sometimes is we, when we're struggling the most, we forget to invite God into it because we think God has gotten out of it. But what if, not that he's causing this stuff, but what if he's using it in your sanctification? What if? What if that fitness coach at the gym is screaming at you for a reason and someday there's going to be a benefit from it? What if? What if? The issue with emotions is uh, many times is when we feel strong emotions, our emotions can overwhelm what we know to be true. When I'm really down, I'm really discouraged, I'm really overwhelmed, I'm really traumatized, I'm really stressed, this weird theological stuff starts coming out. And I start asking questions about things that I typically don't answer when I'm not suffering, or I don't ask when I'm not suffering. You know, you know what I mean? I call it the folk religion starts coming out. The implicit beliefs start coming out. Those things don't happen when I'm feeling good, but they tend to happen when I'm feeling bad. It really opens your eyes to the stuff you're really struggling with. Um, I remember going through a really particular difficult time about four years ago, and I was starting to ask questions about God that I don't even believe to be true about God. Like, do you even exist? Well, I've seen truth. You can't unsee truth once you've seen truth. Remember that? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I had no, there was no question whether God existed for me. But in that stress and in that pain, in that difficulty, all of a sudden, it trickled up. It came to the surface. This is important to see as part of our sanctification because it's in those times where God starts saying, hey, do you trust me? Do you believe in me? Do you believe I've got you here? I know you knew I had you when it was good, but do you know I got you when it's bad? Now you're talking about the rubber meeting the road. So I don't know what you're struggling with today, but what if that's part of your workout? Just saying. See if the meaning and the purpose changes, do you, can you see that there's a possible constructive response that you might have to it? And now the emotions won't dictate as much as they do. This is the struggle. And guys, I work with pastors, and I work with missionaries, and I work with law enforcement, and I work with... Military, I work with lots of different folks in these roles where they're exposed to lots and lots of stress and lots and lots of difficulties. And one of the things they all struggle with is where is God? And I, I keep having to remind them he's right there because we forget when it's hard and it's difficult. And this is what happens with emotions. Um, emotions function to allow us to fully experience life. Um, Jesus felt a plethora, what's the word, plethora? Plethora, thank you. I'm, I'm, my lisp is coming back and I'm not able to speak. Um, a plethora of emotions. See, I'm suffering right now and I'm feeling my sanctification happening as you're laughing at me, not being able to say that word. Don't feel, I'm just kidding, it's a joke, Rachel. Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, so... Jesus felt a lot of things. God, the scripture talks about God experiencing a lot of emotion as well, right? So it's not, it's not like the old school, which is stuff it and pretend that everything's okay. Um, my dear friend, Candy Magnolia. Anybody know Candy? You guys know Candy. Some of you know Candy. It's, she's the reason I got into this work. I just want you to know. So if I say anything that's offensive to you today, go talk to her. She can, you know, it's her fault. We'll blame it on her. See how healthy I am. <laughs> Blaming candy for things I do wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long, long time now. And what's interesting is, is that the emotions that we feel, 
give us a sense of, of, of life. This is, this is the experience of it. When you look at the anatomy of our brain even, if you understand neuroanatomy, what you understand is an information that comes in through the eyes and through our ears, through our taste, our olfactory, through our smell, touch. All, this, all these sensory pathways actually go through the middle part of the brain before it goes to the cortex. And when you look at these, these function, how the brain functions in like functional MRI, you see the limbic system light up or the emotional parts of the brain before the cortex lights up. And it's a split second before. It goes through, runs through the thalamus, through certain parts of the, um, uh, the limbic system, I'm talking the amygdala gets involved, these different parts of the brain, and then it goes out to be processed in the cortex. And what that says is, is that anything coming in is going to be laced together with emotion before you go to process it. The advice for you to just stuff it and do what's right is not good advice. Because God did not make us that way. So the, the problem is not our emotions. The problem is, is what we do in response to our emotions. That's why scripture says things like, in your anger, do not sin. It's not saying, don't be angry. You're sinning when you're angry. Don't be angry. It doesn't say that. It says, it talks about this stuff called the fruit of the spirit. Have you guys heard of this before? Um, remember the last one in the list? You guys know it from Sunday school, right? Self-control. I hate that one. I just, uh, I, I have it right now, but I won't if my wife calls and we end up in a conflict. You know, I won't have self-control then, so I hate that one because it's convicting. But do you see what I'm saying? That's the stuff that we're called to take on, not to remove ourselves from the experience of emotion. We're to have self-control. We're to have the fruit of the Spirit with our emotional functioning. Okay. Emotions allow us to feel passion when we are pursuing someone for a relationship. It allows us to feel uh, overwhelming, overwhelmingly attached to the birth of a new baby. I remember that. Um, um, it, it allows us to feel angry about things that need a, a no or a, a justice reaction, right? The problem with this, though, is that the way things are in our culture right now, we're really struggling with keeping things, our emotions regulated. Um, everybody is super sensitive right now. It's like we've all got a sunburn. <laughs> Ooh, right? Even good, biblical, godly things. The big one right now is the justice movement. I mean, this needs to be addressed. It absolutely needs to be addressed. But the problem with it is when you sense the spirit of people who are engaging that, sometimes what you pick up on is not justice. It's not Jesus being just. It's something else being just. They're calling it justice, but it's really vengeance and bitterness being expressed in hatred. So this is the struggle we're having, and that's just justice. What about love? What about these other emotions that we feel? Um, it's really, really important that you guys see that God is interested in your sanctification, and a core part of that is dealing with your inner man and the ability to integrate what you feel with what you know to be true. Right? So can we be honest? I know it's Sunday, but can we be honest? <laughs> this is the whole performance thing we do when we're in church, right? Who used to say that? Can we talk? Who was that? Joan Rivers maybe said that? I don't know. I've, I remember hearing it on a television when I was a kid. Can, can we be honest about something? Um, we really got to deal with this issue, church. And we're not going to be able to until we're honest about what's really going on in our relationships and in our lives. That's what I mean. Are you solid on the security? Is it finished? Is it done? When Jesus died on the cross and he said it's finished, is it finished for you? In other words, is you being separate from God not an option anymore in your mind? Are you secure if you're securely attached, then you can address these issues because then you'll be honest. But if you can't be honest, it means you're probably not feeling the level of security that you need to be able to be honest. The thing of it is, we're, you're probably not going to be able to feel secure with him until you risk being transparent. Because the experience of him not leaving you or not judging you or not, I don't know, raining hellfire down on you is the healing happens in my office all the time. People come in, they're sheepish about it. 
they've got the issue, but then they have all the shame about the issue. And they come in and they, they, they'll do things like they'll start, they'll whisper. Or they'll, talk, they'll start talking with a little kid's voice when they tell me the truth. And I don't really do anything. I just listen to them and I do what my professors always told me to really think about doing, which is no harm. <laughs> doing no harm. Um, just sitting there, accepting what they're saying, and kind of being with them. And all of a sudden, they have this big transformational thing that goes on. They're like, I, this has been so helpful, and oh my gosh, I feel so much better. And I'm like, what, what about that made you feel better? Because I really didn't do anything. I just listened to you. And they, they'll say things like, I anticipated you judging me. I anticipated you shaming me. I anticipated you making me, convicting me. But really what they mean is condemning me. And when you don't do that, they actually start to get better. That's a huge part of therapy, is that people can come in and tell their secrets and not experience harm for, for being that way. Church should be that way, guys. I wish there was a way we could make that happen faster, but it really needs to be that way. I'd say about 40 to 50% of the people I work with, they don't need a psychologist. They need a community of people who will accept them. It's not to say there's not things to work on. It's not to say there's not truth that needs to be addressed. But you're not going to be able to deal with the truth about who you are until you're secure where you're at. And that's in your faith, and that's in your marriages, and that's in your, your families, and it's in your, 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 the body. Does this make sense? Safety is really, really important. Hey, when we're not safe, we're not honest. It's just that simple. Make your marriage safe. Make, your, make the parenting safe. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about enabling. I'm talking about creating a foundation of safety so you can deal with the real issues. Okay. All right, I'm preaching. I need, I'm, oh, wait, I am preaching, actually. <laughs> I usually say that to my wife. Honey, I'm sorry, I'm preaching. But I can actually preach today because I'm preaching. <laughs> okay. Is this making sense? Okay. Let me, let me open with a, a prayer here real quick for you guys because I want you to prep your hearts for this a little bit. Um, Father, we ask for you to come now and cause us to look inside ourselves. I pray that we would remind ourselves that we are safe with you. If we know you, it's done. It's finished. And, it, and we're going to be with you forever. It's not an issue of abandonment of God anymore. It's an issue of relationship. Show us ourselves in that security and in that safety and challenge us. Let us feel your love. Let us feel your conviction. Let us see the truth and help us to become more like you. Cause us to see ourselves accurately and change us in ways that make us more like your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The verse I brought in, Paul does a good job of dealing with his emotions. Have you, I don't know if you've noticed that or not. The verse I brought in is, the, is Philippians 4, 5 through 8. And I want us to read through real quick. There's two aspects to this verse that really, I think, I think make a, um, uh, uh, an important point to us to help us with this emotional issue. He says this, let your gentleness be evident to all. Wow, there's the safety piece. Let your gentleness be safe, to be evident to all. There's the, there's the challenge to regulate, to have self-control in response to our emotions. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Um, this is kind of where we want to go. Think about such things. So those of you who are Bible scholars, this is a little Bible scholar test. Where's Paul at when he wrote this? He's in prison. He's not out at Sandals, sitting on the beach, <laughs> drinking a margarita. Sorry, if you're a teetotaler, I don't mean offense. Paul never drank a margarita. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, the image. You know, chilled. He's not chilled out in a good place writing this. What's the deal? This verse used to trip me out a little bit. Do not be anxious about anything. That reminds me of Bob Newhart therapy. <laughs> you guys know Bob Newhart? 
You heard of his Stop It Therapy before? If you haven't seen it, look it up on YouTube after service, Bob Newhart, Stop It Therapy, and you'll see it demonstrated. Basically, a person comes in, they sit down, they, they tell their problem to the counselor, and he says, okay, are you done? They go, yes. He goes, stop it. <laughs> Quit. Knock it off. Okay, what else do you have going on? And then the person's like, oh, well, okay, this is going on. And he's like, okay, go ahead. Is that all? Yeah, okay. Here's the answer. Stop it. Quit. And he just keeps doing this until the person doesn't want to talk to him anymore, and they leave. I think I've had that experience in church before. It's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not what Paul's doing. Paul prayed that we would be strengthened even in the inner man because this is the source of our issues. To be strengthened in the inner man, to acquire the fruit of the Spirit, And to be able to deal with tough, overwhelming, stressful situations because we can see meaning and purpose in it. In two ways, an eternal perspective, but also this idea that I'm suffering and God is with me in this suffering. And the consequences of that is it deepens my relationship with God. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying God's wanting us to suffer all the time. But I'm saying when we do, that's what it is that Paul's doing. He's in prison, and he's seeing meaning and purpose. He's, he's, like, a, he's like a parent who loses their child to death, and, the, and they, like a, they say a child's hit by a drunk driver, and that parent then later creates an organization that battles drunkenness. They're, they're, they're doing something meaningful out of something that was so meaningless. Does this make sense? This is, uh, the, the current research is calling this resilience, resiliency. That's what the positive psychology movement is orienting itself towards. The ability to encounter something that's difficult and shift it into something that's constructive rather than something that causes us to go into a destructive mode. And this is the challenge with our emotions because it's the emotions that dictate whether we go in one way or the other. The wills involved with this aspect, you guys, and in my, ca- my experience in counseling, what usually happens is, is people will make the, they'll take the easy path of just caving into it sometimes because they don't want to feel the pain of the grief. They, they are having a hard time accepting the reality of what's happened. And that's a real thing. And in some situations, like I talked about earlier, the death of a child, that takes a long time to do. And we need to be really patient with folks who are traumatized this way. But the journey's the same. Whether you're having struggles in your marriage and conflict, or you're having difficulties in parenting, or you've encountered a trauma like I just described, the journey ends up being the same. Um, Paul's demonstrating that to us here. Um, I remember uh, when I was a kid, typically the way we deal with emotions is different. When I was a kid, I remember my grandparents had a peach tree in their backyard. Big old, what is it, freestone peaches, I think they're called, up in Yuba City area. Big peaches on a tree. And I remember every year we'd go over there and my grandma would make peach cobbler. (laughs) I literally am tasting it right now. Talk about emotions getting attached to memory. <laughs> wow. I'm abreacting the, the taste of her peach cobbler. And I was four or five years old. These are implicit memories. These are not like explicit memories. I can feel it. But I remember that as a tree got bigger, they would, of course, grow more peaches. And then what happens is no one can eat them all, so they all fall on the ground. And they start getting all yucky and mushy and We'd run out in the backyard, and we would run through the peaches and get peach stuff on our shoes. And then we'd go in Grandma's house, and she'd she'd get on our case. We were in trouble because we were tracking in those nasty peaches into her house. Um, The other thing that would happen, too, is when you'd you'd mow the backyard, run over those peaches in those peach pits, and it would fling nasty peaches all over the place and peach pits all over the place like missiles. They were like peach pit missiles, you know, taking out chickens and dogs and all kinds of stuff. Um, Unfortunately, that's where most of us are in the way we deal with our emotions. We, we mow the backyard and we throw emotional peach pit, you know, uh, missiles everywhere. And then we come back later and we apologize. <laughs> yeah. 
Let me suggest to you, apologies are good. Repair is good. But maybe the workout should add another element to this equation. And that is to begin to realize when you're in a situation where you're feeling very strongly about something, that you begin to identify, this is my time for working out. This is the time to start doing the bench breath. Or to start doing, these ones are the ones I hate the most. You know, oh, I mean, just doing it like this hurts. You know, it's just, I don't know if I got weights in my hand. Um, these, these muscles back here. Ugh. Um, Maybe when you're in a conflict with somebody and, and the emotions are starting to dictate your behavior, that's because you're probably working out a muscle that you don't like to work out. And here's the deal. Maybe that's not bad. Maybe that's an opportunity to grow and to be sanctified and to have a different reaction. It's in the moment. It's in the moment. In other words, I think a lot of us sit around waiting for God to take this stuff away. When in my experience, I think what's happening is I'm learning is that he wants it to happen so that I can choose to respond differently. That's the application in terms of developing the fruit of the Spirit. Paul did it really well here. Um, here's the deal with Paul. I've got some cool notes here I want to share with you. You need to understand, he's not saying don't be anxious like He's, he's not saying ignore your negative emotions or your stress or your fear or your anxiety. He's not saying that. We don't, he's not telling us to try and suck it up. That's not what he's trying to get at. Be anxious for nothing. I think Paul is telling Christians to look about and focus on those other things. Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. It's hard to contextualize this into real life, but let me give an example. Um, I leave early one morning and I leave my socks on the floor. I'm, I'm married to somebody who's very organized, right, Lois? Owen? Yeah. My wife's grandparents are here, so I have to be really careful about what I say, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's just being recorded. That's right. She's watching it live right now, I bet. I'm going to get a text here in a minute. You know, so that, um, she likes things to be organized. And so when I leave the socks on the floor, you can see the potential battle here. I'm not as organized as she is. And quite frankly, I'm off to slay dragons. I don't have time to pick up my socks. Pick up my socks? What are you kidding? You know, people are dying out there. You want me to pick up my socks? <laughs> That's my side of the argument. Her side of the argument is, you know, what am I? You know, your hired slave? You know, pick up your stuff. I'm, that's not my stuff. What do you do? It's, that's disrespectful. That's her side to it. Well, that, uh, that conflict can escalate. You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the moment you met each other, just to say this, the moment you met each other, you've inherited your perpetual conflict patterns for the rest of your marriage because it's personality-based. Research shows 69% of the issues you encounter is because of personality difference and you will never resolve them through compromise because you can't change yourself. You can soften yourself and socialize your response, but you're not going to change your personality. Have you figured out by now that he or she's not going to be you? I hate that. I just do because I want her to be me. <laughs> Problem is she wants me to be her, right? You see where this is going. There's a story, and this is where whatever is admirable, whatever is pure, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, this is the practical aspect of this for me. When she asked me to pick up the socks and it's a big deal to her, I need to take that seriously because it is a big deal to her. She's not being trite. What she says in the conflict might sound quite trite, but when you look at the story behind the story, it makes sense. Here's what I know about my wife and my father-in-law. Um, Jack has become a dear friend of mine. Uh, he, my, the daughters of my wife and her two sisters are very upset with me because I think Jack wants to hang out with me more than he wants to hang out with them. Um, <laughs> we've gone very, grown very close. One of the things about Jack is he used to be a firefighter. And I, I get these images. I think he would come home after being uh, fighting fires and saving lives. That's what he would say. 
He would come home and he would clean the house. And the way my wife experienced that implicitly was, that's my daddy loving me. So when I leave the socks on the floor, what message does that give? <laughs> See what I'm saying? There's a story behind the story. And that makes more sense than what the conflict typically exposes. Think about the conflicts you have right now with people you're close to. Could it be that there's something behind it that makes more sense than what you're encountering? And can you regulate your emotions enough to go figure out what that is? You'll resolve it. I just gave away the secret, you guys. That's what therapy is all about. Now you all know how to do it. No one's going to come talk to me anymore. <laughs> That's good. I'm working myself out of a job. Does this make sense? OK. So how does this work? It works in two ways. One is doing it the way Paul does it, and that's to reappraise situations. Reappraise the situation. The one I like the most is the story behind the story. That helps you regulate the emotional reactions to things. It's real practical. The other one is the importance of relationships. The importance of relationships. Um, before I got married, I mean, I was, I was never a perfect guy, but I never thought of myself being, you know, a really bad guy. I was kind of, you know, I was maybe average, above average, maybe. I was a decent guy, I was thinking. And then when I got married, I realized something. I'm not. <laughs> something about relationships that brings things up to the surface that we didn't know was there until the relationship helped bring those things up. I'm choosing that word on purpose, Brandon. It's a reframe. It's a help. Um, and, and even then, that was a, we kind of got stuff worked out. But then we had children. <laughs> and then all kinds of other stuff started coming up. Here's the deal. That, if you're not careful, you'll perceive that as it's hopeless. I am all bad. Uh, there is nothing good about me, you know. You know, Lord, take me now. It's not worth, you know, this is kind of where we go with it. But what if it, you guys, what if that's the gem? Okay, so you get angry with your kids too easy. What if that's your gem? That's your workout. So the thing of it, we got to reframe it, you guys, because if we don't, God's not ever going to be in it for us. We have to invite him into that. And be open to understanding that and relating to him while that's happening. Does that make sense? God, I'm angry. I feel like I'm going to let him have it. You know, I just loaded the shotgun and I cocked it. This isn't good, right? Um, <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> come in and fix this situation. Okay. I think what we tend to do is our conscience pings in a depraved way and we start moving out of this awareness of God in those situations. When I'm, when I'm spiritual again, I'll go back to relating to him. I think we do that a lot. No. I, I know when you walk in the foyer and you shake hands, you're real kind. You're nice. You, know, you ever notice the word nice is not in that list of the fruit of the Spirit? <laughs> Just saying. Um, when people ask you how you're doing, you say fine. Fine is the Christian four-letter F word. <laughs> it is. That, that word does bad things to our transparency. It really does. And I know there's this whole greeting thing that goes on with it. It's like saying, hi, how are you doing? But sometimes we, we stay there. We, we, we live there avoiding addressing the things that we need to address. We're not fine. And God is still God, and he's on the throne, and he's still active in a work in my life. What is that? That's deciding not to play games anymore. I'm going to retitle the sermon, Brandon. I'm going to call it How to Avoid Seeing a Therapist. Because <laughs> this is the stuff that comes up for us all the time when working with folks in counseling. It's people struggling with these kinds of things. So it's reappraising. It's reframing this perspective. It's also relationship. Our nervous system is designed in such a way to where we have a, a reactive uh, thing that kicks in in our autonomic nervous system that takes care of us. You know, when, we see a, when we're up hiking and we see a bear in the woods, things happen that we don't have to sit and think about. We don't, you know, we need to form a committee on this. We need to meet to decide what we're going to do in response to this bear. Hmm. So 
what do you think we should do? Well, we should do this. What do you, we should do that. We should do this. We should, you don't, by, the, by that time that would happen, you'd be mauled and it'd be over. Right? We have this thing God's put in us called the autonomic nervous system, and the fight or flight stuff kicks in, and we do funny things that don't make a whole lot of sense and that really embarrass us sometimes, but it helps us get away from the bear. If that doesn't work, another part of the nervous system kicks in called the parasympathetic system. And what's interesting about this system is it tends to shut things down. Fight or flight is the sympathetic. Freeze and fawn is the parasympathetic. And it usually has to, that's online when you're resting and digesting food, like at Thanksgiving, after you've eaten turkey, you know, you're kind of, oh, you're digesting. That's parasympathetic, you're relaxed. The world tends to promote this idea of relax more, relax more, relax more. Don't be so stressed, don't be so stressed. Problem is, parasympathetic isn't all good. Have you ever heard of SIDS? SIDS is because of an overactive parasympathetic nervous system and an immature sympathetic system. And the body literally forgets to beat its heart and breathe. Parasympathetic is not all good. Have you heard of dissociation before? That's parasympathetic, right? Um, it's not all good. There are some clients who are dealing with depression who are being taught to relax more, and it's making their depression worse because they have a parasympathetic problem, not a sympathetic problem. Here's the deal. In the last 10 years, what we've discovered through research is, is the parasympathetic system has a different system, a, a subsystem to it. And that system actually moves into our face. This is more of a human thing than an animal thing, although mammals have this to some extent. My dog has this a little bit, but you and I have it a lot. And it's one of the things that I think physically that manifests the, the fact that we're made in the image of God. You've heard it said that we are born to be in a relationship. Anatomically now, we know that to be absolutely the truth. That other part of the sympathetic nervous system innervates our throat, vocal cords, our middle ear, how we listen. You know, dogs have ears on the outside. They're kind of doing this. All. We have that same function, but it's inside. It's also in our, the striatic muscles of our face that's responsible for expression. Think about that, facial expression, hearing, and vocalization. What is that? It's communication. That's relationship. They're actually calling that part of the nervous system the social engagement system. That's the technical phrase for it. Go look it up. It's uh, Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory. You can read all about it. But here's the deal. What's that saying? It's saying is, what it's saying is, is the relationships that we're in that prompt all of this stuff were wired to sanctify in those relationships. With God, with God, when you guys were worshiping this morning, your social engagement system activated and it changed the way you felt. When you're in a conflict situation and you're getting all sympathetic with each other, to be intentional about down-regulating through social engagement. There's things I do with my wife that help her soothe when we're in a conflict. Right? And it's different things for different people, but it usually involves rubbing her arm. She's very physical. Rubbing her back and not reacting to her. Not defending myself. Those two things help kind of soothe the situation. If I don't do those things, it can go all kinds of places. She does the same thing for me, but it's using social engagement to facilitate the downregulation of that. Does this make sense? I'm getting off on the science stuff here. This is why you need community. And I don't just mean a community. I mean a community where you feel related. This is why you need, why your marriage partner is essential for you to become conformed to the image of Christ. And trust me, if you dump that one and you go get another one, you're going to have the same issue show up the second time. <laughs> and I know there's issues where that's, you know, we talk about divorce being legitimate or not. But the deal is, the moment you meet each other, you've inherited the struggles you're going to have. I have to, yeah, that's a whole other part of the sermon we don't have time to do. We talk, get the tape from yesterday. I talked all about that. Um, you need each other. You need each other. Maybe, what if, the stresses and the traumas you're dealing with and the struggles in conflict and the difficulties in parenting and the problems with your boss, maybe all of that could be used to make you more like Jesus. Just maybe. Do you follow me? It's a, it's a constructive perspective on something that we all tend to avoid and see as bad. All right. Let me pray for you.
Father, I pray for all of us here today, and I thank you for the opportunity to come here and hang out with friends and family and, and just kind of uh, get to know people again, meeting new folks. And um, I ask that you would be with each person here today. And I don't know what specific situations are going on in their life, but rest assured, help us each realize that it's not uncommon and that the person sitting next to them has the same exact struggles going on that it's common to all of us, it's common to man. And I pray that you would help alleviate and normalize things for us and alleviate that sense that we're more screwed up than everybody else, because we're not. The, the, world, is, the world is groaning, Lord, and we're experiencing that. Help us walk with you more closely as we address those issues. Lord, I pray that for each one of us that we would evaluate our circumstance We would ask you, God, how would you use this to make me more like you? And in the process of doing that, heal the marriage. Make the parenting secure. I pray for secure attachments for everybody's kiddos. Heal the traumas from the past. And help us learn to to feel you through other people that you would love us through the relationships we have with other people. I thank you for Paul and his example. I thank you how he, he was able to reassess that situation and reappraise it and respond the way that he did while he was in prison as a model for us. Help us keep a big picture perspective that this is a war, it's not a battle, and that you want to see us grow over time and that you will, if we invite you in, you will do that. I challenge each of us here to invite you in into our situations, and to try that first before we knee-jerk and do things that would cause more harm. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.